This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication, Lecture 11, Thermal Oxidation, Part 2. The second part of our multi-part series on thermal oxidation will cover the Deal Grove model of oxidation. I'm Chris Mack, and our reading for this lecture is Chapter 4 of our textbook by Campbell. The Deal Grove model is the first and still the most popular model for oxidation, although we have some other models with some improvements over Deal Grove. Nonetheless, all of the better models we use today, in fact, incorporate the Deal Grove model. So it's very important to understand uh, this model if you want to understand oxidation. Remember that silicon dioxide is a grown film. We put it, uh, a wafer in a furnace, we bring it up to a high temperature, we supply oxygen, the oxygen travels to the surface of the wafer, reacts with the silicon, and forms in situ a film of silicon dioxide. Uh, a model, the first model, uh, was proposed by Bruce Dill, Deal and Andy Grove in 1965. They were both working at Fairchild Semiconductor. You might recall that this was the uh, first commercial integrated circuit company that uh, developed integrated circuits for commercial application on silicon. Um, at Fairchild, they invented the planar transistor, John Herney, um, Gene Herney. They um, in invented the modern processes for connecting uh, integrated circuits together with uh, oxides and contact holes and metallization runs over them. Bob Noyce uh, made that invention. And uh, Gordon Moore worked at Fairchild when he uh, penned his now famous Moore's Law. Well, Andy Grove was another principal there at Fairchild along with Bruce Dill working on oxidation. Andy along with uh, Bob Noyce and um, Gordon Moore left Fairchild and formed another company called Intel and Andy Grove eventually became CEO of Intel. So he started with uh, mechanisms of kinetic mechanisms for oxidation and ended up being CEO of Intel. So let's look at their model by looking at first the mechanisms and then the equations we can write down for the rates uh, for those mechanisms. So the Deal Grove mechanism is basically a three-step mechanism in series. First, oxygen diffuses through the gas to the wafer. Everything's going to happen at the surface of the wafer, so the first thing is, is the reactant has to go to the wafer. Once the oxygen is absorbed onto the wafer surface, it diffuses through the oxide. Now, at the very beginning, we may have no oxide, but once oxide starts to grow, silicon is now buried underneath the oxide film. If the reaction is going to take place with oxygen and silicon, uh, two things are possible to happen. The silicon could diffuse up through the, the silicon dioxide, or the oxygen could diffuse down through the film to the silicon interface, and that's in fact what happens. Oxygen diffuses through the oxide and uh, uh, reaches the silicon interface. Then, the third step, the oxygen reacts with silicon to form SiO2. There are some limitations to the Deal Grove model, and it's important to understand what they are. First of all, it's a 1D model. Planar substrates just talks about growth in one dimension. If we talk about growing on a more complicated uh, surface, um, something with topography, 2D, maybe 3D, uh, we can certainly create those kind of models as well, but that's not what the Deal Grove model is. There are definitely software packages out there for doing more complicated 2D and 3D modeling, but we'll only be dealing with the 1D model here. Um, this model is not that accurate if we had heavily doped silicon. Uh, once you start getting really heavily doped silicon, you start changing the concentration of silicon in the substrate that's available to form silicon dioxide. And this model will not take that into account. It's also not accurate for thin oxides. Oxide thickness is less than about 20 or 25 nanometers. This model doesn't do a good job. And at the very end of, of this multi-lecture series on oxidation, we'll talk about uh, some different models as well. Well, let's go through the Deal Grove mechanism pictorially. So at some point in the oxidation process, we have a gas that has a reactance in it. We've got a, a film of silicon dioxide that's at some thickness, T ox, 
so far. It's growing, but at this point in time, the thickness is Tox, and it's sitting on top of a silicon substrate. Step one is the diffusion of oxygen from the bulk to the wafer surface. Now, this could be molecular oxygen, O2, or it could be water, H2O, but the source of oxygen when it, in the gas, whatever it is, diffuses uh, from the bulk to the surface. So in the bulk, we say the concentration is C sub G. By the time it reaches the surface, the concentration in the gas is C sub S. Um, the next step will be uh, that oxygen diffuses from the wafer surface to the silicon interface. Uh, we'll say C sub zero is the concentration of oxygen at the wafer surface. You can see it's actually less than C sub S. Uh, that's because not 100% of the, the oxygen in the gas will actually adsorb onto the surface. Uh, so its concentration actually at the, at the surface will be a little bit less. But then it diffuses through the thickness of that oxide film uh, and reaches a concentration C sub I at the interface with silicon, and then the last step, oxygen reacts with the silicon at the interface. Well, we can write down equations for each of these steps and combine them all to get an overall equation for oxide growth. So, step one, oxygen diffuses through the gas. Well, diffusion is, is governed by Fick's law. We're going to start by writing down the fluxes of each of these reaction rates. And we'll let J sub 1 be the flux of the reactant, oxygen, to the wafer surface. And it, Fick's law says it's the diffusivity times the concentration gradient, dc dx, where C is the concentration of the oxygen. We're going to make a simplifying assumption here. We're going to linearize Fick's first law of diffusion. And because the concentration differences are going to be small here, this approximation will be reasonable. So what does that mean? We'll say that dc, the change in the concentration, is just the difference in the concentration from the bulk to the surface. And that difference occurs over some thickness, uh, and we'll replace dx with a thickness delta. Delta will be our boundary layer thickness. So Across the thickness delta, the concentration linearly changes from Cg to Cs. And then D sub G will be our diffusivity uh, of oxygen in the gas. Um, we will often take this ratio of Dg to delta and call it H sub G, which is uh, the mass transfer coefficient. So in terms of, say, parameters we have to measure, uh, we won't have to measure separately dg and delta. We can only we could just measure hg. So we've turned our fixed first law differential equation into a difference equation, which is much simpler. Also, we'll often relate c sub g or any of the concentrations in the gas um, to partial pressures in the gas using the ideal gas law. So our concentration will be in a uh, number of molecules per unit volume. And uh, by the ideal gas law, that will equal to the partial pressure, P sub G, divided by KT, where K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is absolute temperature. Well, that's the first step. Second, before we get to the second step, we'll have to apply Henry's law. And we could call this the second step and the next one third step, but that's just a matter of how we count. Henry's law tells us that given a certain concentration uh, in the gas phase at the surface, how much of that material will adsorb onto the surface? Uh, Henry's law says the concentration at the surface will be the partial pressure at the surface multiplied by Henry's gas law constant, H, which is a number you can look up. Now again, using the ideal gas law, P sub S is going to be the concentration in the gas at the surface multiply by K times T. So now we can, if we know the concentration at the surface, we can figure out the concentration of the adsorbed material on the surface um, by, by this simple equation. Now we're, let, we're ready for that material to diffuse through the silicon dioxide to the interface with the silicon. Again, we're going to approximate Fick's first law as a linear equation. So uh, this, this J2, the flux of reactant through the oxide film, 
will be the diffusivity uh, multiplied by the difference in concentration from the top to the bottom of the silicon dioxide divided by the thickness of the silicon dioxide. In other words, we'll say dcdx is, is uh, a, it's linear, so it's, it's dcdx is just the slope of the concentration gradient. Again, it's an approximation, but a reasonable one um, if, if the deviation from linearity is not great, which will be the case here. Finally, step three, the oxygen will react with silicon at the interface. We'll assume a first order reaction at the silicon interface, so that J3, the flux of reactant, as it reacts at the surface, will be a rate constant K sub S times the concentration at the interface. Now, there's really, of course, oxygen and silicon reacting together, so uh, uh, simple way of looking at the kinetics, you might say, I should multiply the concentration of the oxide times the concentration of the silicon for my reaction. However, uh, as the silicon is consumed, the interface between the oxide and the silicon moves down into the silicon, so that there is always a constant concentration of silicon at the interface. The reactant's not going away, it's not being consumed because we have this near infinite supply of silicon in the wafer ready to supply more silicon uh, as soon as it's needed, as soon as more oxygen arrives. So this is a, a, an interesting twist on this, and we'll talk more about it later, but as the oxide film grows, uh, the interface silicon actually moves down because silicon is being consumed. Uh, silicon dioxide is about 2.2 times um, uh, more it occupies about 2.2 times the volume of the volume of silicon that's been consumed. Uh, so when we grow this film, about half of the, the film is down into the silicon, and the other half rises above the original surface of the silicon. All right, this is the, the third step, the reaction. Soon, uh, very soon after this reaction begins, a steady state will be reached. We're going to assume that the reaction at the silicon interface is the rate limiting step, it's the slow step, so that the rate at which oxygen diffuses through the gas and through the oxide film will reach a steady state with the, the slow step, which is the reaction, so that it's supplying just enough oxygen to be consumed by the reaction. So all of these fluxes will be equal to each other, and we'll call that the steady state flux. Therefore, we simply need to solve for the two unknown concentrations, C0 and Ci, those are the things we don't know, and eliminate them from the equation. So we know what the concentration is the bulk because you know, we're running the furnace, we're deciding how much uh, oxygen to put in that furnace, so that's something that we control. And then with this steady state uh, set of equations, we can get rid of C0 and Ci, the things we don't know, and write down one final flux equation. The result is shown here. Uh, we have the steady state flux as a function of the various uh, constants, Henry, gas law constant, rate constant, case of S, but also um, the partial pressure of the reactant in the gas phase, P sub G, um, and the oxide thickness. Note also that I've, I've defined an effective mass uh, transfer coefficient H, which is the mass transfer coefficient H sub G divided by HKT. So it obviously has temperature built in, but most rate constants are a function of temperature anyways. Now we have the solution for the flux, but what we really want is the growth rate of the oxide. Uh, and we can convert from flux to growth rate simply because the flux of oxide, the number of oxygen molecules per unit area per unit time, um, can be converted to a thickness knowing the density of oxygen in silicon dioxide. And we do know that. It's about, it's about 2.2 times 10 to the 22 uh, atoms of oxygen per cubic centimeter for grown silic thermally grown silicon dioxide. So, uh, given that number, the rate at which the oxide film, Tox, grows with time, T, Sorry, we have two T's in here. You have to remember that T without a subscript is time, and the T with a subscript is thickness. 
Um, and then it's simply JSS divided by this density N1. So what do we do now? Well, we're going to integrate. We'll take this equation and organize it so we can integrate. That means we'll take the dt and bring it over to this side. We'll take the piece that has tox and bring it over to the other side. And that gives us this here. Uh, now we integrate both sides of the equation like this. We'll integrate from the beginning of time 0 to whatever time at the end of our, our oxidation, t. And then here we'll integrate from some initial thickness t0 to the final thickness tox. Uh, the reason we do that is we can open up the possibility that we're oxidizing a wafer that already has silicon dioxide on it. So T0 will be the initial thickness of silicon dioxide on the wafer when we begin our oxidation step. All right, well, this integral is going to be very easy. Obviously, this is just a constant. So this is just going to be the constant times T over here. Here I have two pieces. I have a constant times dt ox, so uh, that will simply integrate to be a constant times the oxide thickness. Here I have the oxide thickness, and when I integrate that, I'm going to get uh, you know, the oxide thickness squared divided by 2. So we perform the integrals, and then we just rearrange things into groupings of constants. And here's the groupings that we prefer. So as, as you could tell, we're going to have a second order equation. It goes as T oxide thickness squared plus a linear term, T oxide thickness, um, plus a, equals some linear function of time. Um, the constants are A, B, and tau. A and B, you can see, are, are groupings of these various constants, diffusivity, mass transfer coefficient, reaction rate constant. Um, B has the partial pressure in the gas phase of the reactant. And tau is a function of the initial thickness of the oxide. Tau is essentially how long you would have had to oxidize uh, to get to that point, uh, a certain oxide thickness, T0. So it's like a, an offset to the time in the oxidation. Well, this is it. This is our deal Grove model. It, uh, it will be very useful for performing calculations. If you um, um, operate your furnace for a given amount of time, T, you can uh, calculate the oxide thickness that results. Or what we normally do is say, I want to get a certain oxide thickness. Therefore, how long should I run my furnace? Uh, it has these three parameters, A, B, and tau, that we have to determine. And uh, a lot of our work work will be uh, figuring out what these constants are, uh, which we'll do through experimental measurements. So next time, we'll look at how we use the Deal Grove model to perform calculations. We'll try to understand its properties uh, uh, but and, and look at some tables and, and uh, uh, graphs of the A and B parameters. Um, but for now, we've, we've just finished our derivation. So what have we learned this time? Well, you should be able to know and explain the three sequential steps in the Deal Grove mechanism. What are the limitations of the Deal Grove model? Explain the steady state assumption that's used in the derivation. And finally, uh, be familiar with this derivation in general. Well, that's uh, lecture 11. Lecture 12, we'll, we'll continue on our discussion of the Deal Grove model and how to use this equation. Till then.